Hi, everybody. Um, we are really excited to have you here for this awesome webinar hosted by the Island Wildlife Chapter. Um, and we have a great presenter here today. And just one thing to touch base on, you're all on mute currently. If you would like to, um, to ask a question out loud at the end of the presentation, you can raise your hand um, and then we will un unmute you to be able to ask that out loud. Or if you'd like to put it in the Q&A, please put your question in the Q&A. Um, it works better if you put it in the Q&A box down towards the bottom instead of the chat because we want to make sure that we catch everything that you send in because I'm sure there will be some really good, great questions coming in. So um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Virginia Holman and you can get us started. Great. Okay. I'm Virginia. I'm with the Island Wildlife Chapter in the Cape Fear region, and we're really happy to have Murray Burgess here with us today. Murray is an associate wildlife biologist, urban ecologist, environmental educator, and children's author. She is currently pursuing her PhD in wildlife and conservation biology at North Carolina State University, where she is researching the health and developmental impacts of sensory pollutants on songbirds. Murray is also an avid birder and Jedi advocate, which sounds um, very Star wars -y, but it's uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion advocate. Growing up in the Deep South, Murray has witnessed and experienced racial and gender injustice, and she uses her experiences to inform her pursuit of equity, justice, diversity, and inclusion in academia and the natural sciences. And she recently wrote a fantastic article in Walter Magazine uh, that you may have seen when you registered for the webinar. Thank you so much and welcome, Murray. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for coming here to listen to me talk about something that I find very important, especially as a personal issue. So I am going to share my screen and we can get started. So today I'm going to be talking about field safety as an issue for diversity, equity and inclusion. And I just wanted to start by giving you a little bit of my background and what I do for research to contextualize some of this issue. So first of all, as Virginia said, I grew up in Mississippi and other areas of the Deep South, and I wanted to become a wildlife biologist. And in my undergraduate program at Mississippi State, I was usually one of only like three or four um, black people or other minority people in general but um, I didn't let that stop me. I was into reptiles and birds. I even did a little bit of research with coyotes um, throughout my undergrad. And I realized that I fell in love the most with birds and birding, especially after an ornithology class that I did not want to take whatsoever, but it was the only thing that fit in my schedule. So I had to take it. But it was really great because that led to my decision to pursue a graduate um, study studying avian conservation. And so that's where I am now at North Carolina State University. And my graduate research focuses on how light pollution affects the growth and development of barn swallow chicks. So what I actually do is every summer, um, I'm actually about to start like later this week, um, going out to my study site, which is a barn in Snow Camp, North Carolina. And there's a ton of nests in the barn, about 50 of them. And as the birds lay their eggs and hatch their chicks, I measure the chicks as they grow. I measure their head size, their feather growth, how much they weigh. And I also take like little blood samples um, for further analysis in the lab afterwards. And um, in order to create this kind of light pollution effect, if you can kind of see little Christmas lights that I hang up on the roof of the barn and just like focus some of the lights over the nest so I can have that simulation of like a street lamp shining down on a bird's nest. And so that's what I do. It's a very rural area out there. I travel about an hour from where I live to drive out into the country and go into this kind of predominantly white, um, very conservative area for my research each summer. And 
in preparing for my research, my department does like a general field safety, lab safety student seminar. And where we were taught, of course, about wearing proper clothes and shoes. We learned basic first aid techniques, especially with um, how to prevent ticks getting on you and how to remove them in case they do. And of course, venomous snake ID to learn the difference and to look out as we're in these uh, kind of sometimes remote rural areas. And this is pretty much all it covered, just this kind of obvious things to hit for like your physical safety and safety when working with animals. However, none of it really covered anything that was a unique concern for me or for other minority researchers that are in my department. We didn't get a chance to talk about what happens when um, men come up to female researchers and start harassing us or what happens if we get the police called on us when we are out in the field. These are unique concerns for um, people of color and um, things that we often face on a daily or yearly basis during our field season. Um, it includes discrimination from property owners or like just other people we encounter in the field. Um, unnecessary attention from the police, either being stopped and questioned by them while we're out or um, having them called on us as we are out working. Um, in addition to that, some people have to like hide or mask their identities, such as being like maybe openly gay. You don't want to face extra discrimination for being openly gay in the field or if you have any kind of mental health or anxiety issues, you might worry about what would happen if you would display that openly with other people watching. And this isn't just like an outside thing. Sometimes it happens within our own department when our like concerns and issues aren't really being addressed. Um, so these are kind of some of the things that I want to really hit on today and give some maybe um, answers for how we can address these things. Um, I included this picture in the corner. It's an amazing book by Carolyn Finney called Black Faces, White Spaces. If you're interested in doing any additional reading or learning about the historic and current treatments of specifically African Americans in America and thinking about how um, Jim Crow laws and segregation faced us initially, um, how they still affect us today as well as like how the media portrays us and how just kind of discrimination works in a modern setting and why you might not see a whole bunch of minority people in outdoor spaces. So next, so specifically for my safety, um, sometimes I have to go out to the barn at night and that is to check to make sure the lights are working properly, that I have them on a timer and I wanna make sure they're going on and off when I need them to. And just checking the barn, making sure everything is working properly and doing a few little nighttime surveys while I'm out there. And so I mostly have to go out there alone. I try my best to bring a friend or somebody on the nights that I'm out there, but um, there is no like protocol or specific protection that I get when I go out there. And what I always do, I always have to bring my knife, I bring my pepper spray, and I bring my dog every time I go out into the barn. His main job is just going out there and getting dirty and having to come back and wrestle him into the bath but he is also there as a good alert system he barks at people going by and lets me know if somebody's approaching closely um so these are kind of the things that like people might not think about too much as like a black female researcher out by myself in a rural predominantly white conservative environment at night. So that sounds kind of like a recipe for disaster sometimes, but I have to do it anyway as part of my research. Um, so I wanted to emphasize that field safety is really a part of diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially the equity part. 
So removing barriers in the natural sciences is something that I'm sure we've all heard talked about. We've all heard uh, that there's a lack of women in STEM and especially black and Hispanic workers are still severely underrepresented in the STEM workforce. And that goes uh, almost doubly for the natural sciences, like the biologies and the zoologies, um, because of that outdoor component. Not everybody works in the field in the natural sciences, but a lot of it is involved. And a lot of it can be a deterrent because of all of the things that I mentioned before with our unique field concerns. And I put the point just being there isn't enough that there, if we're present in the workforce, then that is diversity, that is inclusion, but it isn't yet equity because we do have specific needs that a non-minority field worker would not have. And it's really difficult to try to regulate that kind of stuff because in a normal setting, you'd have your job and you could go to HR to make the workplace and welcome and you can take any complaints to the people but when you're just outside in the field there is no hr for the field and the people who you might need to complain about aren't your co-workers they're just other people who are out there so how do you even go about trying to make it safer for us if there's no regulations that can be in place and that's kind of what i wanted to talk about next, some potential solutions and mitigations. And I'm going to talk about each of these separately, but the best um, mitigations are representation, field safety gear, implementing more safety protocols and training, and also community support. So let's talk about representation. So I always ask the question, what does a field biologist look like? And if you take maybe 30 seconds to kind of come up with what you think of when you um, think of this question, like what do these people have in common? What comes to your mind at first? Um, I'm going to try to open the Q&A or the chat. I have both open if you like want to actually like drop your answers in there. I'm having a hard time even typing my questions in the chat, Marie. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing um, predominantly white, predominantly male. Yeah. So yeah, that's also able-bodied, yet yeah, that's a huge one. White, middle-aged, older, super fit, able-bodied. Yeah, and that's exactly what I see as well. Um, some of the things I noted, um, usually white, usually male, people who look a little bit older, not like young college students like a lot of us are, um, people who are usually kind of professionally dressed, like they have their little field gear and like specific organizational things that they are associated with, as well as people who are physically fit and people who all of these people are working directly with animals. And um, just a side note, I absolutely love all these people. I grew up with the crocodile hunter and all the animal planet shows. And this is what inspired me to be a field biologist by watching these people. But what does a field biologist actually look like? Well, here are some of the many biologists that I know who are doing excellent jobs and are providing representation in the field. And obviously a field biologist can be anyone of any race or any gender, any age, and we're not always having the same body type or the same level of physical fitness. And not all field biologists are working directly with animals. Some of us um, do like vegetation surveys or monitor water quality. So it's not always directly obvious that we are a biologist if we're just kind of, you know, looking at some grass outside. <laughs> but um, we still count and we'll, we are still there. 
um, I just wanted to kind of emphasize some of these stories that these people um, have and some of the struggles that they have faced in the past. Um, this person on the top far right is Abigail. She recently had the police called on her and her team as she was um, outside doing field surveys, I think bird point count surveys. And despite having on like binoculars and having all their field gear with them, um, they were still questioned and their IDs taken. And thankfully um, they were cleared by their IDs and nothing else happens, but it's of course a terrifying situation to have the police called on you. Um, being accused of, um, they thought that they were like casing a house to go rob. And that's just like a terrifying thing to have people think that you're doing. Um, this person down at the bottom, kind of the middle is Carice. Um, she is a least turn researcher and what she does is go out on the Arkansas River and look at sandbars and judge them for like what kind of habitat the interior least turns are preferring. And her biggest struggle is that the sandbars that the least turns prefer are also preferred by people with boats that want to go there and like set up a party. And so she is constantly disrespected by like the older men that she encounters on the sandbars. Um, they have destroyed her camera equipment. They have completely ignored her and assumed that she doesn't have any authority when she tells them they have to move or she's just there to collect some research and like go away. They have greatly hindered a lot of her progress in her scientific research with these turns just simply because of the way she looks just young and not official enough for them um this person on the top jumping for joy i love this photo this is alex um he is not only a black man but a heavier set queer black man who you don't know if you can openly display any of that um you have to kind of blend in as much as you can to prevent people um, coming at you or questioning you or assuming that you're somewhere where you don't belong. And finally, in the bottom left corner is Tyus, who recently expressed that he has um, mental health and anxiety issues and he worries for himself and other people of color if they were to have a panic attack or some kind of serious issue, would it be taken as a serious issue or would it be looked at as something that needs the police called on them or somebody who's just acting crazy and needs to be arrested? Um, most often park officials aren't trained to deal with these kind of um, encounters and don't know what to do with people who are not given the same abilities as everybody else. And so there are many concerns, again, always emphasizing that we face and that we all struggle with, whether it be um, outward appearance or like our specific identities that we have to kind of control when we shouldn't have to have that much control over ourselves. Um, and so in order to combat that, I am really huge into SciComm. Um, these are just a handful of the platforms that I have spoken on about birding, about research with artificial light, and about um, DEI efforts and like how um, we are perceived in the outdoors and hopefully working to change that um, by speaking out so much. I am also a children's author and a writer. I am currently working on a book called Sparrow Learns Birds, which is going to be about a little black girl in her um, urban environment. And she goes around using her eyes, her ears, and her sketchbook to learn about the birds around her and thus teach the audience how to identify birds. Um, I'm hoping that that can be a very long series with Sparrow Learns Reptiles and she learns all the animal groups. and. I also do a little bit of freelance writing as um, I did last month in Walter Magazine talking about some of my more specific experiences in the outdoors. 
And finally, I also do a blog, which is not a snake doctor.squarespace.com, where I just want to share a lot of my day to day experiences as a wildlife biologist. It's again going back to that question, what does a biologist look like? What does a biologist even do? And I think it's a great way to just share some of the day-to-day -day processes of what I do out in the field and hopefully bring some more awareness to people as they read that blog and get to know me and other biologists. And, uh -oh. and finally, I also do a lot of workshops and um, with um, kids and also like young adults, mainly for ornithology. Um, I teach mist netting and bird banding along with some of my, co my colleagues and talk about just the processes of if you want to get into a grad program or how to kind of get into some of these field positions, especially as a minority researcher who might face these extra concerns that we're talking about. Um, I also do a lot on my social media by displaying some of my research, like little videos and like take pictures and try to engage with an audience. Um, just let them ask me questions and I answer their questions about my research process. Um, I think that representation is especially really important for the young, younger kids so that they can see themselves and know that it's okay to go into the natural sciences and that they can do it too. As much as I absolutely love Steve Irwin and Jane Goodall and Jeff Corwin, I did not see myself in them and did not know until I was almost in college that I actually could have a career in wildlife biology. Okay, that's enough about me specifically. The next point is um, field safety gear can really help. So field safety gear is just any kind of clothing item or like badge or kind of thing that you can put on your vehicle or put on yourself to um, associate you with an organization. And this is super important because that kind of points people who might have a problem with you or are suspicious of you, it points them to like a higher authority like I'm associated with North Carolina State University. I have on gear that says I'm a field researcher and that can kind of help with some conflict mitigation or even prevent someone from like questioning you too much. Um, I was able to get the car magnets that you see in the bottom picture from my department um, simply by asking them by, in, um, bringing my concerns to them and they were thankfully listened and we were able to design car magnets and now we're working on visors and vests for other field researchers. Um, another really cool thing is that you can put QR codes on a lot of this stuff. So that's even more direct contact to a higher organization, because if you scan the QR code, you can see like contact information if you need to complain or you can take your comments to someone else rather than the field researcher right there in the moment. So that really helps with conflict. Another thing is implementing new protocols and trainings. So that could look like just adding another additional learning module for students and advisors. After you talk about tick removal and snakes, you can talk about conflict mitigation and how to de-escalate situations. Um, just feeling prepared for those kind of situations, even if they never happen, can really be helpful to ease kind of student state of mind. The next point is field work documentation. And by that, I mean, making sure that people are aware of what you're doing. Um, so that could look like documenting with your department or with your organization um, when you are going out in the field and when you're coming back, having emergency contacts ready or um, just specific things and procedures like documented, written out and able to be followed. That um, is great for personal safety. So like just people know where you are and also great for um, documenting any instances or occurrences that might happen. 
The third point is options for accompaniment. And another um, personal thing that happened to me um, because of the 2020 um, pandemic quarantine restrictions, I was supposed to have some field technicians going out with me, but because of those restrictions, I could no longer um, have other people with me in the field, which is why I was out alone for most of the time. And I don't have any specific solutions on how to kind of fix that because, you know, a pandemic is a pandemic, but there should be some kind of other options in other situations to like have somebody out there with you, even if you don't have field technicians or your work doesn't require a team, it's still great to be able to have somebody out with you, um, more eyes watching out for you and less likely to be confronted if there's a group of people instead of just one person. And finally, partnership with local police and government is going to be one of the biggest things that would be really helpful um, if um, a research team reaches out ahead of time to the police department and says, hey, we're going to have researchers out here um, from this time to this time, and this is what they're doing, that could prevent anything from happening right off the bat. And also, if there's any way to pass more laws or get more protection from government for this type of research, that would just be really helpful in not only raising awareness, but having legal protections for people who are out in the field. And finally, what can any everyday person do to um, mitigate some of these things is just share, promote, and support any researchers that you know. Um, by looking out for those that you know, you provide so much support and do so much more than you think that it might even be worth, like just asking somebody how they are or telling somebody, let me know when you get back home, that just means the absolute world and makes people more confident as they're going out there. So if you know anyone who does kind of field work, please reach out to them, check on them and just love on them. And that is so amazing. You can also follow and support um, BIPOC organizations um, on social media. That might be your local organizations. Um, both to help raise awareness of them and like show them support, share their efforts so that more and more people can become aware of these kinds of issues. You can also advocate at your local parks and outdoor spaces. You can invite people to them, hold specific diversity events, um, even like voting for particular um, um, like bills or anything that might help with diversity in the outdoors if that um, ever comes up. And of course, make outdoor spaces inviting and inclusive. I barely touched upon any physical disabilities or anything like that. There is so much more that we have to do to make outdoor spaces inviting and inclusive. And the best thing to do is just to listen to people who aren't there. Why are they not there? What do they need in order to get there? It's um, efforts that we all have to make both as individuals and as organizations to make improvements. And so those are basically the gist of what I have to say about DEI and field safety. Um, it's another thing to work on. It's another thing to uh, kind of keep in mind and hopefully one day soon we will see more diversity and more inclusion and hopefully people will feel free to be themselves in the outdoors whether that's just recreational or doing research because it's all important and we all deserve to be outdoors and with that um i would like to open it up to questions and discussions there's so much that can't just be covered with a presentation and I would definitely love to hear what you guys have to say. That's great. Murray, this was a fantastic, fantastic webinar and I just appreciate it so much. We have uh, 
One question comment in the Q&A from Amy Jewett. She says, Murray, I wanted you to know that last year I listened to a webinar by Dr. Milton Newberry from Bucknell University in Lehigh, Pennsylvania or Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. He shared his personal story of a black man getting more involved in the natural sciences field and the many struggles he faced to do this. And he opened her eyes to this issue, the same one that you're describing here today. And she has included a link to his faculty and staff webpage. I believe his name is Milton Newberry. So you can see that in the Q&A. Awesome, thank you. That's wonderful. You know, one thing that occurs to me as we wait for some people to um, raise their hands, um, or, or type questions into the chat or the, the Q&A is you're at a really big university. I mean, NC State is huge. How many, I, I have no idea how many students are currently at NC State, it's but it's- Over 200,000, it's, it's pretty big. Right, so it's a, it's a very, very big school. Um, and I, I kind of wonder how many students are engaged in field research of, of one kind of another, whether it's in the biological sciences, whether it's through an extension program or an engineering program. I mean, this, this is a, a really big, big issue that, that deserves a lot of attention. And are you seeing, um, increased use and, and recognition of things like signage for cars and, and gear and things like that, um, in addition to more, more important issues like including um, diversity, <laughs> you know, all of these things. Yeah, so out of like all of the ecology and zoology and wildlife biology departments, I would say only like a third to a fourth of us actually do this kind of daily field work or um, seasonal field work. Um, a lot of people do work like primarily with data. So they're indoors on their computers and don't really have to think about these kinds of things. And even though it's just like a few of us, it's been really great so far to have these extra like gear and everything for us. Like people have been requesting the car magnets, where can I get those? And um, working on designing different like labels for hats and visors and things. And so for the people who do that work, it's been like super great and important to like making us feel comfortable and hopefully inviting more people to do that kind of field research. It's been really good. Uh oh, can't hear you. Oh, and I would, I would think also um, that people would be, especially professors and lecturers and even graduate students who are teaching classes would be um, including information about, about safety and, and these issues that you raise. Um, in their in their syllabi and in their uh, course materials. Yeah, we're really hoping for more um, incorporation on those like larger levels for like more trainings for advisors who have students working in the field and also for students um, like myself, as we said, like conflict mitigation and just like how to kind of deal with some of these situations um, just to kind of soothe fears, um, first of all, and hope that you know you always hope that none of these situations actually occur but if they do occur like what do you do okay I, I can see this as a a university system wide mm -hmm. um, undertaking not just class by class it's, right. it seems like a a large issue that should be should be addressed Megan Massa is asking, how do you think your consideration of risk in the field varies when it's you versus a technician or undergraduate being alone, interactions with the public, et cetera? That's a really good question. And I think the main difference there is like me being kind of like the head of the project or like the face of the project, I take on more of that responsibility and therefore more of the risk. Um, the work isn't going to get done if I don't go out there and do it. So there's like no other way to rely on someone else to kind of pick up some of these um, other things to carry. 
um, versus like a technician or undergraduate usually isn't going to be out there alone. They're more able, able to work in teams or like with me or other um, principal investigators. And um, even when I was an undergraduate, I didn't think about a whole lot of these concerns just because I was out with the class or out with a group of people working on stuff. And so I think it's um, also a really thing that we should be teaching like undergraduates and younger people to be aware of and to consider if they are trying to go into this field of work um, simply because they might not be aware of it until they get there. And that could also be kind of a blindside thing. Like we don't want people to quit or anything because of any of these issues. Absolutely. Uh, someone at Powder Mill Nature Reserve is asking, how can we make training more accessible to, Bi to BIPOC people uh, to promote diversity? Hi, Powder Mill. I did some of my um, training there, so I love them. So glad that you guys are here. Um, how can you make training more accessible? Um, so one of the biggest barriers I think is um, monetarily, and we definitely want people to get paid on the one hand for their services and for their training. On the other hand, it's so hard for people to afford like the price or like afford the time to get that training. And I, so I think one of the things that could help with accessibility is having like um, free shorter like training days like if you can just come out for one day for a few hours to kind of get your foot in the door that could also lead to other opportunities because a lot of people look for do you have any kind of training whatsoever and just being able to say yes I spent this many hours practicing this skill that can really really help with other opportunities farther down the line. That's great. Does anyone else have any questions they'd like to, to ask? Waiting to see if anybody. Ooh, I think I may have a couple popping up here. Here we go. Claire says, Marie, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. I'm wondering if you have recommendations for communicating possible safety issues to potential or newly hired BIPOC field workers while also not deterring them or assuming that they'll have a negative experience. It seems important to honestly communicate risks while not turning people away. Yeah, that is a super important thing to do. And I think honesty is the best policy in this kind of situation. Like you want to emphasize that we're not just going to throw you out there to the wolves, like these things might happen. Um, here's what you can do to kind of um, mitigate that. And I think the support aspect is important to include in that as well. Like this is what you might face. And if you do face it, this is what we will do to help you out in that situation. Yeah, it's, it's hard to try to not scare people off. <laughs> but you want to make them know anyway. Right. Uh, Peyton Priestman says that she works at an organization that runs a community science project where we have volunteers that go out into the field on their own. I'm thinking about putting together a safety kit focused on helping show that volunteers are part of an official project. I was thinking of including whistles, bright vests, and badges as well as signs for people's cars. Is there anything else you can think of that would be good to include? Ooh, that's a very good list that you already have right there. Um, I would think the only other thing that I would include is like some kind of contact information, just if um, a supervisor or somebody who can like come out there to you if you do have an issue, just some contact numbers. But yeah, that's an awesome idea. <laughs> And uh, Amy Jewett is saying that, Murray, your story that you shared today is powerful. I think many conservation and natural resources-based organizations and state agencies would benefit from hearing future presentations from you in advancement of their DEIJ strategy planning. Thank you so much. <laughs> and and I, I agree as well. 
One, th one thing that's really interesting is, you know, you talk about um, researchers and sometimes researchers who, you know, didn't necessarily say grow up in a certain area or aren't familiar with a certain region um, going into a rural region where they just really don't have a sense of, of the landscape at all. So if you're reaching out to contacts within a community, um, including say the government and the police to let people know that, yeah, you know, you are going to have field, field workers out there um, and, and who are, you know, in need of, in need of community protection. Um, are there also other, other agencies or areas who you might want to connect with um, in advance to sort of build a, uh, you know, build strong alliances. Yeah, I think it'll vary a lot from project to project and location to location. But of course, if there are any like local organizations or like birding clubs or like wildlife refuges or things that you think can both help support your work and help support you um, as a field researcher, I think that would be a really good resource to reach out to and just ask and see what they do, what opinions they have, and like maybe what help they can offer you. Right, right. I think that, you know, people are curious too. What's what's going on? What are yeah. you studying? So, you know, sometimes I think about um, having spent some of my time as a child in a, in a fairly rural community. Um, if a field researcher had come through, I would have been fascinated because we wouldn't have seen anybody like that. Um, we would have seen fishermen um, mm -hmm. or some guy trapping muskrats, but we wouldn't have seen anybody studying them. So I think, uh, right. you know, learning, learning more about what people are doing um, and also connecting with the schools, the local schools might also be um, a really important sort of nexus of uh, yeah. You know. Also great opportunities for SciComm. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, does anyone else have any? I think we may have a few questions in the chat as well. Maybe two or okay. three questions over let's, there. Let's see if I've got those there. Tara, I might. Let... Yeah, that's that's okay. totally fine if you want me to read those, Virginia. I, I'm, I think. Yeah. That... I'm yeah, so I'm popping them out. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that is totally fine. I'll start with a question from Max here. Do you think it would be beneficial for other field biologists to educate and help broaden horizons of landowners for any interactions the landowners may have in the future with teams not of their own background? Yeah, I do think that would be valuable to do. Um, the um, property owner that I work on is very much on board and like interested in the work that I'm doing and it's like good to have me there and if you can just like find someone like that they usually have a whole host of other contacts and other landowners who would be willing to support you and that also provides like great opportunities for like further research and like other projects that could happen in safe environments. Thank you Murray um, and we do have someone saying thank you for the book recommendations. This is coming from Ellen, um, and I can't wait for your children's books. The book you highlighted, Black Faces, White Spaces by Carolyn Finney is great, um, and The Home Place by J. Drew Lanham. Um, thank you for that nice comment. Um, and then we have some more great comments coming in here. Um, I think we have another question now. Yep, let me see. From Chad, great, great presentation. And he's asking, have you reached out to young people in underserved communities and elementary schools to share with them the importance of getting outdoors and possibly a career in wildlife biology? Yeah, I have. So every year I work with the um, Wetland Center's Youth Conservation Corps, and they're a group of like high school or early college students who are hoping to get more hands-on experience in wildlife and always have questions about getting into a career and like or grad school how to do those things. Mm -hmm. um, I have also done work with some Girl Scouts um, just exposing them to bird research and citizen science and things and teaching some like more elementary school-aged kids. 
Um, I hope to do a whole lot more with that age group once my um, children's books come out. So I think that would be like a great way to tie into birding and research and just interests in the outdoors. Yeah, you seem like the best person to make those links there with the youth. Um, so I just love that. Um, and we did have a question from David. Any experience with M-A-N-R-R-S groups? Yeah, I have a little bit of student experience. Uh, uh, experience with a manners group, um, mostly in undergrad for a couple of years. Um, my manners group that I was a part of focused a whole lot on agriculture, so I'm sure it would vary group by group how much um, natural resources and natural sciences get focused on, but they are a great organization to try to check out. Thank you, and then I think we just had one question asking if you could provide your contact info in the chat for folks and We'll make sure to send that in the follow-up email as well. Um, yeah, this was, and this I was can awesome. also display the my contact slide again if that's okay. okay. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Yeah, I'll share that and put it in the chat. Perfect. That's. I think that's all I see in the chat. If I if I missed anyone, please. Um, Okay. Please go ahead and put that question in there again. But I think we got most of the comments. I think that's about it. Murray, is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience? I don't think so. Just thanking you again for listening and hopefully considering some of these options. Um, thank you so much for having me. This, is, this has been a fantastic webinar and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to share this with us. And I, I hope that... Um, it will get broader play within the within the university system because I think that these are these are really important issues and you're doing a beautiful job of um, getting this information out there and raising awareness. So thank you so much for your service. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much and have thank a great you. day. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great day. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.